Well, hello, this is Mark Diaz Truman, one of the organizers for Indie Plus, uh, here with Crossing the Line, an interview with James Grimm Desborough uh, that has gotten some attention this week on the internet, uh, especially on Google Plus. Um, so before anything else, before we introduce Grimm uh, and talk a little bit about his background, um, I would like to issue uh, Indie Plus's first disclaimer. The opinions of Mr. James Desborough expressed in this interview do not express the opinions and thoughts of the Indie Plus community, organizers, or participants, nor do they express the opinions and thoughts of Chronicle City or any other company for which Mr. Desborough has done work. This interview should not be taken as an endorsement of his views by anyone other than Mr. Desborough himself. In addition, Mr. Desborough takes complete responsibility for his own opinions and recognizes that his presence as a guest is a privilege, not a right. Mm -hmm. The conversation tonight will not simply be a restatement of Mr. Desborough's views, most of which can be found elsewhere on the internet. Instead, Mr. Desborough has agreed to an interview in which uh, I plan to ask tough questions in the hopes of digging deeper into the issues that Mr. Desborough has raised. We hope that the discussion helps to advance the conversation in regards to the role that rape and sexual violence play in fiction and role-playing games, but we recognize that there are many people who will not be participating with us today because of the traumatic nature of that discussion. Please consider this a trigger warning for rape, sexual violence, violence against women, and aggressive speech acts. Now, Mr. Desborough, uh, goes by the name Grimm. Uh, you may have seen him on the internet uh, posting about various things, including free speech, role-playing games, fiction. He has a, a broad um, uh, purview, shall we say. Uh, James, could you tell us a little bit about what people might best know you for? Um, I don't know. What would people best know you for? <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably the Munchkin's Guide to Power Gaming all the way back in sort of 99, 2000. I think that's what most people know me from. And you've worked for several publishers. I have worked for Wizards of the Coast, uh, Steve Jackson Games, uh, Cubicle 7. I'm currently at Chronicle City. Um, I've done bits and pieces of freelancing here and there for, for other people. Yeah. Now, um, for our audience at home, Grim and I have actually sat down and talked a little bit about what we want this interview to, to be like. This is not the very first time the two of us have spoken. Um, and we agreed that the goal for today is to explore some of the issues that he's raised um, in, a, in a manner that is uh, hopefully respectful um, and gets to the heart of some of these issues. Um, and so I think my first question, or the first the place I want to start is maybe to hear a little bit from you about your perspective on uh, a blog post you wrote uh, that sort of thrust you into this particular limelight. And the, the title for the blog post is In Defense of Rape. Um, and I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about what mm -hmm. made you want to write that post and how you perceived it to be received. Um, well, it needn't have even been about right. That was just the, the topic at the time that was getting the attention. Um, what it was, it was about the time that the um, new Tomb Raider Lara Croft game was getting quite a lot of attention. Um, and that was kind of the, the kickoff point for making that post. But there had been all kinds of other stuff leading up to that at the time. Um, my concern as a writer, as a, as a creator, as an, as an artist, is that I believe anything and everything should be open to examination through art, through writing, through games, through whatever else. Um, and I've felt for some time that there's a sort of censorship, a de facto censorship coming from torch-wielding Twitter mobs, for, for want of a better term, really. Um, and it's getting to the, to the point where free expression, I feel, it, is genuinely being threatened. And one point of view that this stuff should not be out there seems to be the dominant view. And I know people who have suffered bad things like rape happening to them who don't feel that way. So I felt it was very important to offer, offer a counterpoint. I mean, the thing is, it wasn't even about gaming. I was uh, particularly, I was mostly talking about writing. It was on my on my author's blog, not my okay. not my game blog. Um, but then it just blew up out of, out of all proportion, I think. But then that kind of helps make my point. Okay, so you titled the the article "In Defense of Rape," not "In Defense of the Use of Rape in Fiction." And I was wondering if you if you had some some comments on why you chose the the more um, one might say controversial title for the post. Well, in like the, the first line of the blog, I say that it's link bait. <laughs> I thought I'd get that out of the way right, right at the start. I um, mean, you know, it, it draws eyes. I was hoping that people would not only go to the blog because of the title. I was hoping they would actually read it as well. That may have been slightly naive of me. I don't, I don't know. 
what do you think about that uh, decision in retrospect? Um, maybe, maybe what do you think about writing the whole post in retrospect? I'd, I'd do it again. Um, it's the things that came after I possibly wouldn't do again. Um, okay. Because, like, honestly, I couldn't believe some of the responses I got. I thought they were ludicrous, over the top. I couldn't honestly believe that anyone had taken that blog that way. So my response was sarcastic, <laughs> which is a common defense for me in, in, in humor. And possibly I, I wouldn't do that again. But I think the original blog post is still sound, still makes a, a good, reasonable point. OK. So let's talk a little bit then about the, about the aftermath, one might say, of the, of the blog post. Um, immediately after you posted it, um, there was quite a bit of discussion, I believe, looking over your, your blog and several of your other uh, post that this is an astronomically high number of comments and responses and attention. Um, and then there was a boycott that was launched, or a, a change.org petition that was that yeah. was launched in an attempt to um, sort of protest your employment by several other uh, of the of the publishers that we had mentioned, Mongoose and Steve Jackson Games particularly. Yeah. Um, and I just just for the people who may not be familiar with this. Um, that change.org petition has been taken down. I don't. There's no way to get a, a link of it that is active, but it did include language that that implied that you actually were defending rape, um, which was uh, at which worst, yeah, no. which, right, which which was at worst a very malicious reading and at best erroneous, right? That that that's yeah. not actually what the the blog post said. Um, and I'm curious as to your response to this petition. What what did you feel and and what did you think about it when it went up? Um, well, I think, I mean, look, this, I, made, I made a blog post about a creative issue um, to do primarily with writing. And these people's response was to try and terminate my employment. Um, that's not reasonable, <laughs> is it? How can that be considered reasonable? It's not, despite some claims to the contrary, I wouldn't say that that's particularly reflected in, in my work. Um, and that just shows the kind of censorious attitude that I find so disturbing and, and troublesome. Um, okay. So you you say that that it's well, okay. So to be fair to the people who have put up the who put up this particular petition, they did not simply cite the the post that you wrote as the only reason for asking you to be dismissed. Um, they do yeah. actually, and and I'm I'm not as familiar with the work as, as your work as other people, but they have pointed to some uh, some some particular pieces of your work that they felt yeah. also supported what might be broadly thought of as rape culture, which I know that you dispute exists, and we've yeah. had some conversations about that, but that they feel that it's not just simply about your work in this particular post, but about your work more broadly. What's your response to that? I think they have a particular set of lenses on, so they will interpret anything that comes across their field of vision as being somehow supportive of that. Uh, the works they reference are typically satirical in content, meaning that they're actually against the kind of attitudes that they're talking about. Excuse me, there's a moth attacking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, this, this, this idea like that, that satire, right, satire plays a huge role in, yeah, satire in the way is that dead, you... Right. <laughs> the satire plays a role in the way that you understand these conversations. Um, and I think it's something yeah. that's come up, I've seen in several of your posts. So I was wondering, before we get into satire, though, you made a comment earlier about censorship, right? And I was wondering if you might be able to define censorship as you understand it, uh, um, so we can maybe get, get some sense of what, what you're talking about when you say it. It, 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 it is quite nebulous. Um, I've been becoming more hardline anti-censorship as time has gone on over the last couple of years as this sort of stuff's been going on. For me, I think my best working definition of censorship at, at the moment is where you cross the line from saying... I don't like this, to this should not exist. And you take steps to try and make sure that it doesn't exist, it's not expressed. Okay, so for example, um, let's say somebody put together a movie uh, in which Nazis, uh, you know, Nazis who worked at the concentration camp uh, were perceived as heroes for putting Jews into concentration camps. So this is extraordinarily, you know, controversial and, and disruptive yeah. and upsetting to many in the Jewish community. Um, and I was to say to you, James, I don't want to go to this movie. I'm not going to. You would say that that would not be censorship. That would be fine. If I was to say, 
I'm going to try to launch a boycott in which I encourage others to also not go to the movie for the reasons I've listed. According to your definition, that appears to be censorship. Boycotts get into the muddy area that I was talking about. In, in, the, in, in, the, in the hypothetical instance that you're talking about, probably that would be, that would be okay. Sometimes boycotts get spread, and they get spread on falsities and malicious rumors and so on. People exaggerate the bad side of whatever it is they're talking about in order to you know, make people hate it and not want to go and see it. Um, I'm trying to think of a case in point. Um, well, in our you, hypothetical do remember, case. Sorry, do, go do, ahead. Do, 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 do you remember the um, Christian right organized protest against the Golden Compass? Right. Yeah. Yes. Now, for, yeah, for I, as far as I'm concerned, they were making a much bigger fuss of it than than, than was than was justifiable. If they want to say it's it's anti-Christian or whatever, that that's fair enough. But they were saying other things. It's similar to the things they've done with D and D, claiming it's satanic and and so on. It, it, it's dishonest. If you have a genuine beef with something, you should be able to express it and show that there's a problem without having to exaggerate or lie. Yeah. Okay. So for you, the line between censorship. And uh, the ex like free expression because we would I would broadly think of boycotts as a form of free expression actually a very yeah. crucial form of free expression. The line for you is at which point the boycotters are falsifying information or promoting yeah. incomplete evidence. Yeah. So for example, like I say, that, that 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 when you get to the boycott level, that that's where you have to talk about specifics. It, it's very difficult to to unweave it all. Okay. So for you. It was censorship when someone attempted to launch a petition uh, because they said they were the attempting to you know, actually silence my voice and stop me from being able to work and express myself. If they don't want to buy my stuff, fine, but they were trying to intervene at the company level and say, do not employ this guy, and I think they were being misrepresentative in the way they were going about that. What if they were not? What if, for example, uh, you, had for, you had, say, for example, defended rape? Hypothetically, if you had said, I don't think rape is really a problem, um, I, I just don't think it's really that big a deal. Um, many times rape is just not really, it's consensual, and I just don't see it as a problem. Let's be clear, that's, that's not what I said. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what you said, but if you yeah. had said that, would they be justified in I'm, I'm, I'm very wary of people taking things the wrong way from this interview, so I want to be <laughs> absolutely <laughs> clear on that. I am not saying that, I never said that. If I had. Again, that's a difficult one. Does it relate to my Does it relate to my work? Um, would the fact that I hold appalling views necessarily impact on my work? H.P. Uh, Lovecraft was an appalling racist, but his work stands out. Um, does Does yes. his work truly stand separate from racism? I think it does. I mean, there, there's still elements of it, but you've got to think of it in the time, in the period, in, in the context. But if you look today at Orson Scott Card. Yes. I think um, boycotting and refusing uh, to attend his you know, the film being made from his book and so on, I think that's justified because Orson Scott Card goes beyond having obnoxious and terrible opinions to the point where he takes the money that he gets in and puts it towards campaigning against, uh, uh, so was it for or against Prop 8, I, f I forget. Sure. Whichever against. one which was, which was going to stand in the way of gay marriage. Um, you know, so he actively uses his, his money. He goes beyond his simple e e expression to cause harm, in my opinion. So um, I think that's more justified. So if I had expressed that opinion, yeah, I could, I could understand why, yeah. Okay. So... A lot of this discussion about, about what is censorship, what is not censorship, what, what should be allowed and what should not be, seems to revolve around the idea of harm, right? When one has done harm to another, yeah. uh, when one is harmed. Um, and I know that there is a significant portion of the people who would have signed the petition who believe that your post by sort of more broad, I don't, I don't want to put any words in your mouth, your post uh, appears to some, and I would say including myself, um, as having trivialized the position that others hold about the usefulness of rape in fiction. Um, and broadly, this relates to the idea that there is this thing called rape culture. And if you're, if you're unfamiliar with that as, as, a, as a new viewer, the idea is that there are certain cultural attitudes that are promoted um, fairly consistently that undermine uh, rape victims' ability to make their case, either by 
uh, sort of broadly saying rape isn't that big a deal, or making light of it, or saying you know if you report rape, uh, you know it's it's just not you have there's a really very high burden for it. And I'm not necessarily doing the rape culture argument justice because that's not the focus of this piece. Mm -hmm. But but the the idea of your interactions with that broader concept is to say that by saying that rape is a I think you say quote fucking awesome plot device. Yes. It actually perpetuates the idea that rape can be a go-to place for writers to go without necessarily having to treat it well. Um, and I think that I would broadly support, and I don't want to speak for any communities beyond myself, I would broadly support the use of rape in fiction um, if it's handled in a way that's respectful of rape victims and doesn't that's marginalize that. anybody. What, and so, what, no, don't finish, finish your thought. No, so I'm thinking there seems to be, in my mind, some reasonable disagreement uh, about whether or not your post contributes to rape culture. And I'm curious as to your thoughts on that, because if, and, and I understand you disagree with some of the premises, but if your post does contribute to rape culture, and if rape culture is harmful, then you have done harm that would justify putting forward a boycott. I'm not necessarily sure that I would support such a boycott, uh, or, or uh, I'm not necessarily sure that I would be interested in starting a boycott, but that the harm burden that you put forward does appear to have been met. So okay, I'm curious, um, I'm, like, we might want to rewind it to the first step and say, how do you feel about rape culture? Uh, because I think that reasonable disagreement starts from that premise. Okay. As I've seen it used, and I don't know whether I've seen the term used correctly or not, I am I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm an amateur at this, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a dilettante. I've, I've only really been studying these kind of things and the terminology for the past year or two, so by no means an expert. But as I've seen the term rape culture used in conversation with me, I do not believe that that exists. I don't recognize it as, as a concept. I think there are rape subcultures, um, like athletics teams in, in US high schools seem to have an unhealthy attitude towards, well, not just women, but a lot of things. But if you were to say to me, identify a rape culture, um, actually, I took, I took some notes down on this. Um, there, was an, there was an Australian woman in the United Arab Emirates who was gang raped by three of her co-workers and she was arrested for sex outside marriage. Um, her and her attackers all got the same sentence. She eventually uh, only had to serve eight months due to international pressure. But that to me is a rape culture. That you know, The country as a whole seems to accept that these things happen to put a lot of blame on the woman um, in ways that I personally find unacceptable. Whereas if you look in this country or let's say Steubenville, uh, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Steubenville. Okay. It'll, it'll do. Um, you know, the people were found out, arrested, everyone was horrified. Um, the excuses and stuff that were made didn't hold any water. I think their sentencing was a bit light. That's That would be the only indication I, I would see of anything approaching a rape culture. Like I said, I think it's a rape subculture because the culture at large, the international community, were all horrified. So to me, I, I, I don't see any real mileage to be had in this in this in this argument, except to be used as a bit of a crude instrument to attack things people don't like that they think are excusing it. So, so, for you, so, I, I've, so I've correctly identified where you and I part ways, right? It's, it's yeah. not it's not so much that uh, I believe that you're doing harm. You agree you're doing harm, and you don't care. It's that we actually disagree about whether any harm has been done. Yeah or on the, on the very existence of the, the concept in a meaningful way in the context that we're discussing. Yeah. Sure. So I think the Steubenville case is actually a, a wonderful example of the broadness of rape culture. And I think it's interesting that you point to it as an example of sort of the, the subcultures of rape that you've described. So we might say yeah. a prison has a subculture of rape where yeah, we'll that's broadly accept... Yeah, and that's one that sure. impacts men more, so I think that's a really right. good thing. Right. So that, that, and I think we would agree that there are certain subcultures in which rape is normalized at a, at a completely different level, right? Yeah. But in the Steubenville case, one of the sort of uh, big news stories that came out of that as it was finalizing was that Candy Crawley, who is not, I don't, I don't, not at all a, a, a pro-rape advocate, Right was was the CNN reporter reporting uh, on the Steubenville case as the verdicts came down, and when the boys were sentenced to something as you put it very light, it was like it was two years, years. It was two years or something for yeah. for, for yeah, those of you not familiar with it. 
yeah, for those of you not familiar with the case, I mean, it's really horrific um, what, what happened to this girl that um, had, had been victimized by these, by these two boys and by the community at large that did very little at first to help her uh, when she was being dragged from party to party. Uh, Candy Crowley's first reaction was, these poor boys, their whole lives are ruined now by, what, by this verdict. And for many of us that, that are in, uh, that, that think of us ourselves as anti-rape culture, that, that was a perfect example of the kind of statements that seem to say, yes, it's horrific that rape happens, but the real tragedy, and whatever follows the real tragedy, right, is, is ultimately diminishes and demeans what actually occurred, which was that these two boys committed, in my opinion, what is, what is one of the worst things that I've heard high schoolers do. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, we've got no disagreement there particularly. Um, at the risk of getting myself into deep trouble, I would say that Western um, judicial systems are supposed to be based on the idea that you, you do your penance and that you, yeah, you have the possibility of reform and then you re-enter society as a as a you know, more fully rounded and capable human being again, and you know you've served your punishment. I don't think that's, that's the philosophy behind Western judicial systems. I don't think it's particularly true anymore. But I do think we have to remember that perpetrators are also human beings, even so, if they've done something terrible. Sure, sure. So that statement for you does not imply at all any sort of any sort of diminishing of the the rape victims. I don't want to. No, no. I, I agree that is a terrible thing to say, and what was going on at the time should have been concentrated on the on the victim. Or so. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I just want to enter that note of caution in sure. that we should not monster people who have done terrible things. They're still human beings. They have the capacity to be sorry and to. You know, I'm trying to think of the right phrase. Well, like, I think I think you know, we would both both agree that rapists are people. Right. I mean, I think that I think yeah. that's one of the challenging things about dealing with rape is that um, if we diminish the agency of everybody involved, we haven't done a particularly good job. Right. Yeah. Uh, if we if we just sort of say, and, and in fact, one thing that I think has been sort of shown to encourage rape is to say, well, rapists are monsters, and so if you're not a monster, whatever you do is fine. Right. Yeah. In fact, yeah. many times, uh, rapists are ordinary people who make bad decisions. And this a dangerous idea that men have no agency over their own sexuality, which you see in a, in a lot of religions. And actually, that, I think that's dangerous. That gives people an excuse. To, to rape people? To go beyond all sorts of bounds, really. Okay. So to return us to the kind of the original discussion then, if, yeah. if, if I look at that and see evidence of rape culture, of, you know, this is a mainstream CNN... Uh, you know, very bland. It's not not exactly a, a harshly conservative or harshly liberal, uh, you know, kind of statement. It's not coming from an extreme position. It's coming from a very centrist position. And I point yeah. to that and say, well, this is evidence of, of rape culture. What What is your response? What do you see that as evidence? I still don't see that as, as a rape culture. I see that as an individual reporter. I still see that the, the boys got arrested and put away, even if I think the sentencing was horrible. Um, horrible in the sense of not enough. Um, but I still look at the reactions of the culture overall. When you say culture, I think of the whole, the whole shebang. You know, the, the national and international uh, people. I also think as, uh, one thing I think it's important to, to frame this whole discussion in is the mm -hmm. fact that yeah, you know, I'm British, European, sure. not American, and I think our cultures are much more different than people give them credit for. Yeah, I would, I would think that having spoken both with you and with some of the other Indie Plus organizers who are, who are British as well, that the differences are subtle uh, and significant <laughs> and, yeah. and often overlooked. Um, um, so so to, to come back again the, to this point about, about disagreeing about the harm, right, um, I think it brings up an interesting um, sort, of, sort of line of thinking about what, what speech deserves to be protected, right, and what yeah. speech is legitimate. And so you've said that you... you absolutely want people to speak uh, as individuals. So if someone was to say, boycott your work on an individual level because they find you personally distasteful, that the, and yeah. they may even make that well known. I, I, I would be hurt, but I, yeah, that's fine. But that's fine. You would, you, would, you would move on, and you think of that as legitimate. Yeah. Um, but you don't think it's for everybody. Right, right. Now, there's people have preferences. Yeah. Um, 
but that when people come together, especially in the case that we're discussing where someone erroneously reported what you had said, yeah. uh, that, that that approaches censorship. And so I'm curious, if somebody really believes, really deeply does believe, they're not, they're not you know, uh, putting up a front or, or misleading themselves in any way, they really believe that your work does contribute to rape culture and they believe such a thing exists, and they were to say that you were a rape apologist for doing so, would you support and fight for their right to make that statement and make it public? <sighs> See, I would consider that to be lying because I believe as deeply that it's not true. So then we would have to go to a, a third party. Um, I mean, it's the sort of thing that if I had the funds, I would sue over for being libelous. Then, you know, the court of law would determine it. Um, I guess so that gets to a question of what is a lie. It's a, it's a strange question to ask in the middle it's, of a role-playing game podcast, but how, um, do you, how do you define a lie? <laughs> it's very difficult. I would say something that is untrue. But it's possible to be a pious liar, which it means you believe fully what you're saying, but it's still not true, um, as well as being this controversial <laughs> author figure. I'm also a skeptic and a fairly active atheist, and you run into a lot of pious lying uh, on, the part of, on the part of theists quite often. Um, there's also this idea in, in some groups that lying is justified if you believe enough in the end. So there may be people who would be willing to lie to prosecute a particular... Which I've been really desperately trying to avoid the word agenda, but it's the only one that really fits here. You know, pe there are people who are willing to lie to prosecute a particular agenda but because they believe you know, that the, the, the ends justify the means. Okay, but let's leave those people aside, because I think both you and I would agree that anybody who lies to further their agenda is ultimately um, not a legitimate yeah. actor. I think people can lie without realizing that they're lying or understanding they're lying. I think they can believe things that aren't true and can profess and, and promote those ideas. Okay, um, so... Can so, we go back to the blog post yeah. a little bit? Yeah. Because um, there were several questions you asked, and we've, we've only really dealt with the, with the red culture one. Um, all my post was really saying was that no topic should be off the table. We should be able to explore these topics. I was not concerned with whether someone does them well or not. That, that's too subjective. You can't make a ruling to say that, okay, you're allowed to talk about rape, but you're only allowed to talk about rape if you execute it very, very well. Okay, but what do you mean by the word allowed in that case? Um, in this case, it would be sort of social permission to discuss it, I suppose. Um, I mean, it seems to me that you you observe many social, uh, cens like uh, censorship is too hard a word, social pressures, even in this podcast, right? So, so like yeah. you and I are having a, a discussion about which you think I am deeply wrong on several subjects, and yet you've given me time to talk, and you've yeah. given me, you, you've even uh, engaged my hypotheticals despite the fact that you think they're wrong, because yeah. you know you're not allowed to just simply overrun me and say whatever you want to say. So it well, seems like you're... Well, <laughs> <laughs> you see, it, I mean, just, well, you're, you're, you're engaging in a respectful discussion, but usually when we talk about these things, the atmosphere is so toxic, no one is willing to listen. You know, there is no interchange. So that's that's why I was so, so happy to do this. But um, while well, you say that, and I agree that there is a certain respect in this conversation that allows us to have a freer exchange of ideas, I also recognize to some degree that it's much easier for me to have that conversation because I have never been the victim of rape. And I have never been the victim, at some level, of rape danger. There's very few times in my life okay. where I felt... Um, but I have, I have talked with people who have had quite appalling experiences about this stuff. Um, and that's been respectful conversations as well. I don't mean to imply that people who have been raped can't have those conversations. Only that, <laughs> only that I have come from a certain position, and I know you, you don't like the word, but a certain position of privilege, in that I, I have not. Ha I, it's much easier for me to address you uh, respectfully and, and according to the social pressures by which you're setting up. Um, and I don't mean to make this point other than to say, when you say aloud, you say it with a certain sort of derision uh, about we're only allowed to do X or do Y. And my point was to say, I think we observe those those sort of social permissions every day, all the time, 24 hours a day. Mm. I'm I, but, I don't I don't walk into public naked, both because I don't want to be naked, but also because it would earn me some degree of social ire. And so mm. I'm wondering about this conflation. Oh, but should of, it? But should it? I mean, this well, that's a that's a question of of 
not necessarily whether it should, which I think is 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 too tough a topic for us to engage in. Oh yeah, but, I just wanted to put it out. Yeah, but but more importantly, when you say the word allowed, right? Whether you're allowed to do it, I'm wondering if you're if you're talking about freedom well, of expression or freedom from criticism. No, criticism's fine. I mean, um, but you see, I, I doubt. I, Okay. I, I, I doubt anyone who has had this, this huge problem with me and, and what I was saying about you know whether we should or, or should not talk about rape. I doubt anyone would have a problem with, say, The Handmaid's Tale, which definitely depicts rape, and it de depicts a genuine rape culture yes. um, where it, you know, it, it, it's baked into the society in that, in that book. I doubt anyone who's kicked up such a fuss about me simply saying, you know, we should be free to explore this topic would have a problem with Margaret Atwood, and she's a great writer. Um, but that shouldn't be the criteria upon which we decide whether you can tackle a subject or not. It shouldn't be limited only to people who are really good. You know, anyone should be free to free to explore and learn and you know, figure out their way on the on the topics that interest them. Um, you know, if you if you say you if we have this huge social pressure that no, you're not allowed to tackle this subject, think of what we'd lose. You'd lose your at word. I mean, if you want to take it to extreme, you'd lose alien because that's really about rape in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I guess what my point my point here is to try to differentiate what the sort of try to complicate the monolithic structure you're putting for, forth. You hmm. seem to be saying that society will decide what is allowed and not allowed. And yeah. things that are allowed will be allowed to be published and to be seen, and things that are not allowed will somehow be disappear and be pushed well, away. And, and I guess my, my question is this. What is the difference between criticism and censorship? Because you seem to be putting forward an idea of censorship that says... Censorship is enforced. Um, now, where this gets tricky these days is that it's not government censorship that we need to worry about so much. Um, the problems we tend to run into don't come down from government in terms of censorship. They come down from companies and community standards. Um, have you been following what's been going on with Tumblr at all? I have, I have not. Is this, this is about community standards in Tumblr? Uh, yeah. Now, um, recently Yahoo bought out Tumblr. Okay. And they, they promised that they would not interfere with the adult content on Tumblr. And in a way, they've kind of kept that promise. But what they've done instead is they have taken out the adult category, they've cut out all the adult content from being indexed on search engines. So while they haven't actually got rid of it per se, they've made it impossible to find and use. And this is 10% of their user base that they're willing to, to you know, throw under the, throw on the tracks um, for the sake of advertisers. Okay, uh, so, so, that, so that clearly for both of us I think would be a case of, I, I would maybe not say censorship, but I would certainly say a limit of expression. That certain corporations, especially Google, Yahoo, uh, you know, uh, Tumblr, right? Yeah, all of these have an extraordinary control by just flipping a switch can change uh, yeah. huge chunks of what our society is able to view or not view. Yeah. But according I, I to call it de facto censorship. Sure, I, I I think that that might be too strong, but I, I think the sentiment is something we broadly share. Um, yeah. According to your logic, however, if I step forward and try to organize a boycott of Yahoo. Based on the idea that they have censored, uh, they have censored this system. That yeah. if they reasonably disagree with me, right? They they can say no, we haven't censored it. It's still all available. They have there's some sense of reasonable disagreement. They could actually feel that I'm censoring them. Um, you wouldn't be censoring a boycott unless you you, you lied about it. I, I wouldn't feel that that was censorship. I think you've got a legitimate voice of concern there. Um, okay, the, so the, so the, the, the from access. Right, so the issue then is it's criticism as long as it's based around a legitimate concern. Yeah. Okay. So now they may answer with their own legitimate concerns in that, oh, there's problems with advertisers or we don't want sure. children to get access to this content and so on. But, the, you know, there's, there's plenty of safeguards around there and it all rings a bit hollow. And, you know, after the promises they made, it's, it seems hypocritical. Um, right. So if somebody was to step forward and say, um, say you wrote a book in which a rape or someone, not you, someone, writes a book in which rape features prominently. And they yeah. deal with it very poorly. People who are yeah. raped in this book love it. They're like, yeah, I love being raped. It's fantastic. Um, and the book, the book really drives home that rape is the primary way by which men and women should relate to each other. And 
the women in the book are, are very, you know, just love it and they think it's really great. Um, and it's not sort of pornography or designed to titillate. It's not sort of put in this category of fulfilling people's fantasies or clearly being demarcated as a fantasy. It's, yeah. it's, it's central to the book, but it's not actually about rape as a fantasy or as, as fulfilling people's mm -hmm. sexual needs in that case. Um, and a group of people, probably some of the same people that you feel have, have attempted to censor you, work to uh, get the publisher to stop publishing this book. And they do so by critiquing it. They form a boycott and they say, if you're going to publish this book, publisher, we're not going to have anything further to do with you, and we're going to make that very public. They're not erroneous about any sort of piece of it. They just they just advance their position based on the information that's directly drawn from the book. Do you still feel that that would be censorship? I would need to see the harm um, to make a, a judgment on that. I mean, these, these detailed hypotheticals uh, are quite, you know, no, I, did, I think it identified something really key. So for you, it's not just that it's true. It must, all, it must first be true, but yeah. it must also show a demonstrable harm. Yeah. I mean, you made all the exceptions to, to erotica and stuff because, yeah. well, that would have been my first comeback, is that right. you know, plenty of people have these fantasies, plenty of women. Um, that doesn't excuse rape. It doesn't mean rape's okay. It just means people have fantasies. And I have a very, very strict demarcation between fantasy and reality, and I think most gamers do. Um, but for some reason, when people find their, their, their pet subject, they don't seem to understand the difference. Now, this, this hypothetical book, I mean, I can't, I can't even imagine something like that being written and published particularly, to be honest. Um, so it's hard for me to, to grapple with that. Um, well, but with the advent of self-publishing, right, there would be yeah. any number... Well, okay, if, if, I've got, if I've got to make a decision, then, like I said, my, my views on free expression have become radicalised. Over the over the past couple of years, so I would say, fine, put it out. It's not for me. I don't like it. If you don't like it, tell other people it's rubbish, whatever. But they should have the right to publish it, okay. and they should have the avenues to publish it. And you're so a lot of this comes down to whether there's harm done, right? That we we kind of yeah. circled have circled back around to this idea of harm. And one of the things that we had talked about previously um, was the hashtag I believe in women. Um, and, and yes. sort of this idea that when women tell us they are harmed, so this is a hashtag on Twitter, I think, that was trending for a while. Yeah. When, I, when women, I, I believe women, I think it was. I yeah. believe women, yeah, I believe women. That, that sort of the attitude is if, you, if a woman tells you that she's being harmed by something, that we yeah. believe them. Either if they say, I've been raped, that, that the, the sort of default case should be belief. That if they say, uh, this particular imagery is harmful, it, it makes me have a... Like I feel that, that it's attacking my self-image. That we should we should at least believe that some harm has been done. Um, and you have a have a, a different reaction to that. So I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I don't believe women. I believe evidence. Uh, I don't believe men. I believe evidence. Um, I don't believe anything. <laughs> I, I believe evidence. So uh, nullius in verbum. It's the uh, I think it's the Royal Society's motto. It's take nobody's word for it. Um, just because someone claims something doesn't mean it's mean it's true. Um, now, in personal relationships with people, that might become complicated by emotion. But as a general general rule, I think everything needs to be shown, to be proven, to be demonstrated before it should be believed. How could I demonstrate to you uh, that I am harmed when the harm is completely internal? Then is it really harm to the extent that? we should necessarily stop others doing it. Um, this is the problem with offence culture. I think you don't have a right not to be offended. Are we classifying offence as harm? Where, where are you drawing the line? What are you, what are you calling harm? I think that's a, I think that's a valid question. Um, when I think about harm that's done, um, clearly there are times where harm is, is is uh, easy to see. If you were to say, take a knife and stab me, I can point yeah. to the wound and show, say, here, look here, this is yeah. the wound, this is, this is how James stabbed me. Um, but if a man is to rape someone, that there is very often little physical evidence that could prove, that could show beyond, that show the same way the knife wound has occurred, because of this particular social and, and psychological dynamics of rape. Um, many times uh, women have reported that when they were raped, and we have good evidence that they were, say people that are caught on camera uh, mm -hmm. saying no, that in fact they lock up and they panic, uh, and that, that resisting becomes very difficult. Or, for example, if I was to have a gun and say, you have to have sex with me right now or I'm going to shoot you, if I don't actually shoot the person, 
there is actually little evidence that that person has been raped other than their particular word. And yeah. so I think that before we get to this level of what is harm uh, that is done completely internally, I think we can see cases in which harm may be difficult to prove the same way uh, a gunshot or knife wound is, is, is provable. Okay, I, I take your point. Um, I think some of that is not so much down to the evidence itself, but rather this culture of shame that we have around around sex, whether it's rape or whether it's normal sex. So I think the solution is not to shift the burden of proof, which is after all fallacious, but rather to somehow ease that sense of shame and, and, and the problems around that. Um, you still can't, you know, even with these difficulties and circumstances, you can't just take someone's word for it that something has happened. Um, yeah, this is the entire principle upon which our justice systems are based, is, you know, innocent until proven guilty. Um, and if you, if you can't provide enough evidence, then we have to come down on the side of, of innocence. We, the, the, there's just no choice. The miscarriages of justice are, are too big a problem. We can't lock someone up on the off chance that they were a rapist or a murderer, um, especially in places where you've got death sentences. You know, how, how can you take that risk? You, you, you just can't. Um, I heard something absolutely astounding earlier early today. I was looking at some of the threads about this interview, and someone said something like, um, the demand for evidence, the demand for proof, is victim blaming, and I was just really you 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 really going to go there to to the extent where you're going to dismantle the entire logical framework of, of the justice system? It's it's insane, it really is. I mean, I I feel sorry for people that can't prove that bad things have happened to them, but we just it's not possible to go the other way because the miscarriages of justice would be terrible. So in the legal system, right? We have agreed as a social contract that yeah. we're going to tolerate some degree of harm done to people uh, on the basis that that uh, we would prefer to err on the side of caution. Yeah. Right. So so we seem to say uh, there are going to be times, and we all agree, in which someone is murdered and that their murderer walks free because the police lack the evidence yeah. to put them to put them in jail. And we all accept this. Yeah. You seem to be advancing a different thesis, which is actually that you reject the idea that harm has been done. Without evidence. Without evidence. Yeah. Not that. Not that it doesn't mean. I, I don't think this is just. A, I don't think this is just a thing for the justice system. I think this is a, a very, very broad, yeah, you know, applicable to pretty much everything uh, principle. I mean, in, in science, it, it's it's the key principle as well. You know, how do we determine truth with evidence? Um, and you have the burden of proof. So if we don't have evidence to support a conclusion, we have to hold it false until we have the evidence. Um, and you just you you can't you can't make an exception to that. The, the risk is too great. Do you feel that you've been harmed by the uh, accusations that have been leveled at you? Um, well, going back to what you said about stabbing, um, I I have a mental illness. I, I suffer from moderate to severe depression, so I do know that harm isn't necessarily physically Physical. manifested. Um, but I would have a hard time proving that to others. Um, I mean, there are psychological records, and the, the ringer I've been put through over the, over these things has definitely done me harm. I could probably get some kind of records to, to show that that happened, but, you know, it's not an easy thing to prove, but I accept that. So for you, there's been definite harm. You feel harmed. I consider myself to have been harmed by this because a lot of accusations and stuff have gone around that just aren't true, a lot of misinterpretation, um, and no amount of explanation or anything seems to make any difference. So yeah, it's, it's a problem, but I don't think some of these people can be reached at all, so I've just had to kind of learn to accept it, really. And yet, in this case, uh, you think that I'm in error if I say to you, James, I, yes, I, the fact that you told me that you're wrong is actually evidence for the harm. Yeah. But without evidence. I mean, like, I can't offer you evidence now that I was hurt. Well, but if I accept you your statement as evidence. evidence... now that you were hurt or someone else was hurt. You know, we could gather evidence to, to support it, but then you've got to do a cost-benefit analysis as well. I mean, 
like I said, like we were saying earlier, where do you put the point at which harm begins? And what about the plus side? Free expression allows all kinds of things, and even people who have suffered the same experiences um, may gain catharsis or understanding or something from the same material that might hurt somebody else. You just, you know, there's no blanket rule here, so you gotta, you gotta be careful. Okay, so we've talked previously about about hypotheticals involving, um, you know, people being raped or 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 otherwise uh, writing fiction that that may create harm or or might harm people, um, and I'm curious as to to the degree to which you think harm should be prevented. Um, so one of the things that's come up that we've talked about um, and that has been you have brought up as an issue, especially recently, are anti-harassment policies at cons. Right? That there's these are these are institutions or uh, instruments that are designed to protect people from harm. Um, and so I'm curious uh, as to hear about you know what how do you view anti-harassment policies as failing to stop harm or or rephrase. Is it that you view anti-harassment policies, which you oppose, as failing to stop harm, or do you view them as uh, not being adequate to stop harm? What exactly, where does your opposition come from? Uh, in okay, this case? Um, I may end up talking for a while here, so strap yourself in. <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm against harassment, um, but I would like to know what exactly what people mean by harassment. Um, I think an anti-harassment policy is like strapping a jet engine to a duck. It's unnecessary, the duck can already fly, and it's probably not going to do the duck any good. We don't need them. There are already, there's already the law of the land, so illegal activity can already be sorted out. Most conventions already reserve the right to expel people for any reason whatsoever. Um, I've seen the harm that discussion and promotion of these things has done in the atheist community, I've seen the damage it's done in the hacker community. Um, quite often these harassment policies seem to carry a sort of Trojan censorship policy. Uh, if you look at the geek feminism um, sort of example anti-harassment policy, if you were to implement that it would mean no cosplay, um, no practically no fantasy artwork if you were to really strictly talk about it. Um, no discussion of sexuality in games like this whole Windy Plus thing has been. You couldn't have that because it mentions sex. Um, okay, but let's let's be specific about that. What what specific language in there do you feel would preclude, uh, say, for example, this topic? Okay, let's see. I did cut and paste it into my notes here somewhere. Um, Oh, it's missing. But it talks about sexualization, uh, but it's so loosely defined, it's not even defined at all. Um, it's like that, you know, what's pornography? I don't know, but I'll know it when I'll see it. It's so vague, it could be used to apply to anything. They talk about sexual imagery, sexual costumes, whatever. You know, all it's going to take is one person to be annoyed that someone's dressed in a say, as, uh, dressed up as slave layer and that person could be expelled under these under these rules. It's just so rife for abuse. Specific example being Violet Blue's talk at uh, I think it's B sides B slides conference in San Francisco. Uh, it's like 20 minutes before her talk was meant to go up, which was about uh, sex, drink, drugs. It was basically about protecting yourself from these problems. Uh, from problems surrounding them and saying which ones are good for it. She's a she's a feminist, but she's a sex positive feminist. It's 20 minutes or so before her talk, she's taken to one side and told, "We've been told that your talk might talk about rape or blah blah blah," and basically it was used to censor her to stop her having a talk. Yeah, you know, when it was already known what it was about. It's people are you know are willing to abuse these policies to to prosecute their their agendas, and I don't think. That's the kind of environment I want to be in. I don't want to be at a con where everyone's unwilling to talk to each other across gender lines, where nobody can dress up and enjoy themselves. It's it's puritanism. It is puritanism. Okay, so I'm I'm a bit confused about the jump from being anti-harassment policy to anti-policy that contains these pieces, right? So, um, but if you I, have, if you do say. Yeah, you know, I, 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 it's more. I understand what you're saying that there are certain harassment policies that um, that say uh, have language that you feel could be too broadly applied. 
I, I understand yeah. that as, as being your core concern. Um, well, and, no, my core concern is that they are unnecessary. My secondary concern is that okay. the idea that they're necessary is being used to smuggle censorship into convention spaces. Okay. So on the first, and, and this censorship, um, you believe it to be censorship because the people who are advocating for it can't demonstrate any harm? Yeah. Okay. So and I, I would say they're actively harming other people and they're harming the conventions as a whole. Another example would be the Amazing Meeting, um, which... I think 20, 2010, 2011 was up to 40% female attendance. It's a big skeptic meeting for those who don't know. Okay. Then there was a big fuss about harassment policies, and even though there'd been no harassment reported or anything, the fuss about it and all the discussion and the you know, outrage and the back and forth over this policy appears to have been a contributing factor in dropping that attendance from 40% to 18%. Okay. And that's a that's a big draw, and that seems to me to go against what the supposed goal of these harassment policies and things are, which supposedly is to give women safe spaces and make more of them feel comfortable in attending. But the the fear mongering, the scare mongering about harassment that doesn't appear to have existed on any significant scale has made things worse, not better. Okay. So it seems to me that these concerns, while while I don't, I'm not familiar with the specific instances that you're talking about, so I, I can't comment to them or really even, uh, I think, adequately interrogate them. Um, I, I do get a sense from you that you have a perspective that you think should be included, uh, and I think might even, uh, there, may, there may be people who would even agree that your perspective would be valuable in constructing these. I, I think the conversation is extremely one-sided and... It's all coming from the people who I perceive as being a minority, um, who are quite out there. Um, but it's so, it costs so much socially um, in terms of, of time and abuse and so on to offer any kind of counter view whatsoever, however reasonable, that I don't think enough people are willing to do it. You know, I guess I my question, and I sure. the price. My yeah. question then is why are the, are, are you, it seems to me that you seem to be asserting that you believe that the goals of the anti-harassment policy in the abstract, the goals of increasing female attendance and making women feel welcome in these spaces, that you share those goals. Am I reading you correctly? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That you disagree only with the tactics by which an anti-harassment policy... The tactics, the methodology, and I believe it's being used dishonestly to bring in this censorship agenda. Okay. So if there's an anti-harassment policy that works to achieve those goals without triggering for you what feels like censorship, without without doing any of the things that you've done, would you support its implementation? I still think it's unnecessary, so I wouldn't support it because mm. it's a waste of effort. Okay, so let's go to let's go to that point. What what should determine how, how by what standard do you determine what is necessary or unnecessary for convention planning? I mean you know, there's there could be any sort of event, but particularly for conventions, what's your argument that these are actually irrelevant? Uh, there's a difference between, let's say, I mean, we're leaving aside some of these other problematic elements, which I agree could be could be distressful, especially if we're constantly talking about how terrible these environments are and that there's yeah. nothing good in them, that that could have the effect of, of diminishing, uh, you know, female or minority attendance. Um, I struggle with that myself. Uh, I, uh, I often do new admit days for graduate school. I, I have had a very negative experience in my school uh, in regards to race and gender, uh, yeah. but I don't lead with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the first thing that I say. Uh, yeah. Is yeah, this is this is awful. Um, I want to try to contextualize that so that it makes sense to people. So I understand your concern. I'm not sure that the anti harassment policies in question do that, but I understand your concern. Um, but if we were to leave those pieces aside and just say we have an anti harassment policy that you would otherwise support, it doesn't do any of these things, but the the people who are putting it forward believe it could create a safe space. You would say that it's still irrelevant and still shouldn't be implemented. Still irrelevant, still pointless. It's a waste of everyone's time. It's a waste of printer ink. Yeah, you know, the law of the land. Laws of the land already mean people can't be harassed. So if there's a problem, fine. Report it to the convention people. Report it to the police. Get it sorted out. You don't need a specific policy against it any more than you need a specific policy in a restaurant. We do not poison people. Yeah, you know, we have our solemn promise that this is a safe space and we will not put cyanide in your soup. You'd be asking yourself. Why do they need a specific policy against poisoning their customers? You wouldn't be thinking, oh, great, I don't need to worry about being poisoned in here. And okay. it's, it's kind of the same thing. So, so you're, you're making sort of two Im implied assumptions there, right? One is that harassment at cons, for example, is 
occurs at no higher a rate than it does in the normal world. I've, I've yet to see any evidence for it. I'm always open to being persuaded if someone has any you know, well-researched, good evidence, and I doubt there is any, and I think that's something we need to look into, is getting some actual you know, proper figures on this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, but I wouldn't say society at large. I think conventions is more akin to going out to a bar or going out to a club or something. It's a big social occasion. You've got a bunch of people who are into the same kind of stuff in a space. There's going to be you know, flirting and so on. So I expect it would be slightly higher. I expect it would be akin to these kind of social situations rather okay. than the baseline societal norm. But I wouldn't expect it to be above that. So you believe that it would be higher than normal. So, for example, it would be like going to a restaurant in which they serve it, it, some it, it, fish that could be poisonous. Yeah, right? like, it, like going to a sushi restaurant where some things on the menu might be dangerous. Might be, might actually be dangerous, yeah. Okay. And yet that's not enough to compel you to think that it would be relevant to have no. a If no it was a, a special and particular problem in conventions, then I think there's more of, a, there's more of an argument to bring it in. Okay. So you, you would think, if I was to present you with research, and you and you know I think we both agree that research has to meet a certain standard, and sample size has to be large enough, and we have to do it over multiple cons, that kind of thing. If I was to prevent you, present you evidence that said, yeah, harassment at gaming conventions is much, it's much higher, up. really yeah. high, then that would persuade you that an anti-harassment policy would be... Then I would think we need to do something. I don't know whether it would necessarily be... Harassment. We're, we're going into hypothetical level Yeah, again. sure. I mean, but, but you would be in favor... Okay. And so from my perspective, I, I would agree with you that, that these terms of the debate are pretty pretty clear. If it's not a problem, I'm not all that interested in solving it. Uh, yeah. I don't like solutions that are heavy-handed because I generally, uh, in, in principle, across the board, prefer people to be free to make their own decisions. Yeah. Uh, but I have heard from both my close partner, uh, women that I know, uh, people that I have read on the Internet, that harassment is, a, is an extraordinarily large problem. At, at gaming conventions. And I've okay. seen with my own eyes that men treat women differently at gaming conventions than they do at the bars that I go to. Not that this, they treat them particularly well at the bars, but yeah. that there's a, there's a different standard of behavior. This may be a, a cross-Atlantic thing again. Um, I haven't been to any American conventions since 2002-ish, okay. so I, I couldn't speak to what American cons are like these days. Um, conventions I've attended here in the UK, I've never seen anything approaching harassment. I've never had any of my, my female friends tell me about any harassment. It may just be a different attitude. I don't, how are we defining harassment? This, this is another problem. Um, you you know, know about Elevator Gate? I know a little bit about it, yeah. Okay. See, so a guy gets into a lift with a famous skeptic woman called uh, Rebecca Watson. He's just given a talk about not harassing women at conventions, oddly enough. Um, and it's something like 3 a.m. and he asks her if she wants to come back to his room for coffee to talk about stuff he finds her interesting. Right. Um, she says no, that's the end of it. But it's blown up into this huge thing. Was, was that har harassment? I wouldn't consider that harassment. People may lambast me for it, but you know, as described, I wouldn't think asking someone for coffee, being told no, and just leaving it, not pursuing anymore, not pressing it, not giving her any problems or anything, I would consider that harassment. Some people apparently would. So we've got problems with definitions as well. It's not easy. We need a common language. And a lot of the problems with gender studies and things is, is that they're using a language that isn't used outside. So it becomes very difficult to communicate effectively between you know them and everyone else. OK, so I, I think that there's some some truth to that in terms of with any specialized link, any specialized group, right? Whether that's, um, you know, the atheist movement or gaming yeah. or science, right? Well, yeah, try, try describing what you do in role-playing games to someone who's never played one, then... Sure. Yeah. It's difficult. Um, but yeah. you, I think that one of the, one of the things that I think many uh, feminists would find troubling is that you seem to be saying, until there is evidence, we shouldn't take any action. But without, without sort of recognizing that the costs of not taking action don't fall on you at all, right? The chances, I mean, the chances that you're harassed at a con are very, very, very low, if for no other yeah. reason than because you're a man, and it's very difficult to sexually harass men relative to their power position in society. Oh, right? I don't know. I think there's been times when 
other people would have called what happened to me harassment, but um, I wouldn't. And that's another point. I think men are brought up to brush this stuff off and not pay any attention to it, whereas women are brought up to take it very, very seriously. I think that's another aspect of the problem here. Sure. I think what I mean is more that uh, in this elevator gate situation, and I, I don't know if this is harassment or not, but I, I don't know enough of the details of the case, but one of the key principles of the complaint was that this was 4 a.m., right? It was very, very, very late in the evening. Um, Rebecca Watson was on an elevator by herself with a man who was presumably larger, more physically capable, and in her mind, threatening. Okay, and but isn't that... that no, no, carry on. No, so that, that, that sort of, that standard, right, of the fact that men actually can grab women and force them to do things or even, even not even rape them but violate them by grabbing them, groping them, touching them, physically dominating them uh, is something that, while yes, it can happen to men, is not a reality that men think about very often. Like for me personally, I don't think very often about when I'm alone in, in closed spaces with other people that they are stronger than me or physically bigger than me because very rarely am I in a situation where that is the case. Okay. To address that then, um, I think it's unfair in the extreme to presume that any given man is going to do that. And that seems to be the attitude that's being expressed that you have to treat every man as a rapist. And I can't accept that. I won't accept that because most men aren't. Um, Okay, but Watson, the specific Watson situation, you know, most rapes are committed by people you know, didn't know this guy. They were in a crowded public location, even at 4 a.m. There's loads of people around at these conventions. You know, the likelihood of anything happening to her was remote in the extreme, and so it's it's an irrational assessment of risk. Um, but then she's contributed to other people having the same irrational assessment of risk. It's like how the media over-reports crime, even though it's been going down for you know, a fairly steep rate for a decade, to the point where old people are afraid to go outside because they, they've got this view of, of the risk of crime, of being mugged, of being murdered, carjacked, whatever, that's way above the odds of it ever actually happening to them. Um, and I, I think that's a problem. I think it's insulting to men to assume that they're all ravening beasts. And I think it's it's bad for women to have this helplessness instilled in them by people who are supposedly their advocates. Okay, so we we you made a couple of statements there that I think are interesting because they lead me to a very different conclusion. Um, so you, you make a couple of points that I think I think are broadly supported by the evidence, and I would I would agree with most people are not raped by strangers on the street. They're most people who are raped, both men and women, are raped by people that they know or have a relationship with. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, you know, you said that this was a public space. Um, I would disagree with that in the fact that the issue was the elevator. The issue was being inside an elevator, being inside a closed space. Um, yeah. but, the, but the first point is actually the one that I'm curious about because for me, if I knew that uh, a, a large number of people experience sexual violence, we might disagree over the exact number, but if we expand I, sexual I violence to be unwanted sexual uh, intrusions, right? So rape is definitely in there, but also mm -hmm. groping, uh, physical, any sort of physical touching that's unwanted, that, that makes people feel uh, humiliated or lesser. If we, if we broadly expand it to include that, the number is relatively large. It's not necessarily everyone, but it's a, it's a, it's a sizable minority at best, right? Would you agree with that, that, that there's, there's um, a sizable minority of people? I think that's, that, that, that's broadening what we're talking about beyond rape, actually. Um, yes, to, absolutely. I don't, you, don't know what you'd call it, sexual harassment, or sure. no, that's not even right either. I, I don't know, physical something. But yeah, but, that, that's broadening it beyond rape. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, it's, and it's unfortunate and traumatic, and, and we would like to help everyone avoid that situation. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But we also can't paint one entire gender as monsters. Well, I don't know if we're painting one entire gender as monsters if we say that, if I, if I was to know, for example, that some sizable proportion of people like me, whether that's because I'm uh, a man or because I am uh, uh, you know, live in America or because I do whatever, are going to experience this thing. And, that, and this is the really crazy part. And that you don't have any idea who's going to do it. 
It could yeah. be this guy on the elevator. It could be my friend James. It could be my friend uh, Aaron. It could be my you know my girlfriend. Right? Okay. Any of those people could end up hurting me in a way that would deeply that would stick with me for a very long period of time. Okay. And I'm curious as to your conclusion that that means that they shouldn't be afraid of strangers. No, they shouldn't because you know, you've got to you've got to assess the risk rationally. Like I said, I mean, you take a risk every time you cross the street. You can't expect every car to hit you, or you'd never get across. Yeah, I mean, as a man, as as men, we are far more likely to get into a physical altercation than women are to have anything happen to them. We're far more likely to get into a fight. Um. But we don't worry about that, do we, so much when we go out? I mean, the specific situation might. Um, well, but you're you're assuming that you understand my risk, right? So, like, you're you're saying like we're more likely to get into a fight. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a, a fight, right? We're more likely to get into a fight rather than rather than just simply somebody punching me. But yeah, okay, we're more likely to get into a fight. I do think about. Actually, when I yeah. go out and I have an interaction with someone, especially another man at a bar, and that man gets uh, aggressive with me or physical in any way, I am yeah. very likely to retreat from that situation because I know that we're more likely to get into a fight. And yeah. I know that because that's a risk that, that I have at a greater propensity because I'm... Mean, the thing for me is it, it feels like hypocrisy to take men as being so risky just for being a man. I mean, I would, I would hate myself if I reacted in that kind of way to a person of colour in a, in, a, in a dark alley, in a street, saying, you know, clutching my wallet or whatever. I would, the moment I walked past them, I would feel terrible, but I was a racist because I had that reaction. Um, why isn't there that same kind of self-analysis going on when we broad brush men? It's so, so then I guess my question would be to turn back to you and say, if women are saying that there's a different situation, I would agree that I would feel terrible if every time a person of color uh, walked up to me in my community, being from, I mean, being a person of color, being somebody who's from that community, I would feel terrible if somebody told me, look, Mark, every time I see a Latino person like you or like your friends or like your family, I get nervous that you're going to hurt me, and that they would point to statistics and say, actually, look, you know, uh, violence occurs all the time, and Latinos are often uh, part of that violence, yeah. that I would feel terrible, right? Um, but I don't think that logic holds because women sh have a very different reality than I experience, right? And I think that what I'm curious about is you seem to, when you say, I don't believe in women, I believe in evidence, one of the implicit assumptions of that statement is that when women speak, it's not evidence. And you say, no. well, I don't believe in men, I believe in But then in when men speak, it's not evidence either. But what, what evidence are you looking for there? If, if Rebecca says, I felt deeply threatened, I felt okay. like I was in danger. You seem to dismiss that. Okay, no, no. All right. She felt in danger. She was worried. Was she actually in danger? That that's that's the crux of the point. Her her feeling threatens is just feelings. It's not sounds harsh, but it's not really that, that relevant. Um, you know, I have an irrational fear of maggots doesn't mean they're actually going to hurt me or anything. It just means I find them disgusting. Um, so this goes to the core of, of something that I think we, we want to bring up before the interview concludes. We probably only have 10-ish more minutes, so I want to get there. You, we talked at the beginning of this call about trigger warnings. I, I gave a trigger warning to people who might be watching it. And you actually don't find trigger warnings to be useful and find them, uh, as we and I'll let you speak for yourself, but, but the issue from with trigger warnings is the idea that if you experience an emotion that sort of floods you, if there, if you feel like you are harmed, that that is actually rem remarkably similar to being harmed. And so I'm curious as to your thoughts about trigger warnings, because I think it clearly relates to this issue of, if you feel something, is it real? If you are that sensitive to a topic that you can't bear to read something about it, then I think merely seeing the word listed in a trigger warning should trigger you. If, if you're that sensitive and you don't have enough self-awareness to realize that an article or whatever is going to possibly contain something that, that distresses you, then I, I honest, I don't see the point of trigger warnings and I, I object to them. It's all, almost in the way that I would to spoilers. I, mean, I don't want to trivialize, but it feels like an, in, it feels like an, in, an intrusion. Um, and like privilege, trigger warning has effectively become a trigger for me. It's, it's a big red flag that the person you're talking to 
isn't going to listen to you. They're, they're radicalized to the point that they're not going to talk to you, they're not going to listen to you, they're not going to pay attention to anything you, you have to say. So, yeah, I, I don't think they serve a useful function. So today on this call, we've, we've explored rape in pretty explicit terms, right? We've said, if you were raped in this situation, or if this particular thing happened to you, or described, you know, physical violence as it relates to rape, you don't see those as different in terms of content than a trigger warning that says rape and sexual violence? You don't think that I might... Think, I think if you're that sensitive, then the trigger warning would trigger you. I mean, we're discussing the topic, but we're discussing it in a, in a fair, rational, civilized way. We're talking about it, we're not advocating it. You know, it, if, you've, if you've been hurt, conversations like this are the sort of things you should be listening to. And you should be participating in the conversation, not ignoring it. You know, so I, I, actually, I, going, going right, back to, right back to the beginning, you know, part of the reason I advocate so strongly for examining these subjects is because they're important. <laughs> um, and I don't think they should be swept under the rug because they're horrible. Um, that's what makes them effective in a, in a, in a way. And I, I think we need to, we need to have conversations in, in, a, in a broad cultural sense about these things. I don't think we can ignore them and pretend they don't exist or make them not exist by pretending they don't. I think that, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. And one of the reasons I wanted to engage in this call, despite the fact that you and I disagree pretty, pretty seriously, is because I think discussing it is valuable. Uh, yeah. But I also think that when I talk to women who have been subject to sexual violence or rape, and they tell me that trigger warnings help them deal with media, I'm very loath to tell them, you're wrong. They don't. They don't actually mm -hmm. help you. You're telling me that they do, but I just don't believe you, and, and I, I think you're wrong. And I'm curious yeah. as to why, why you think your judgment is more accurate than the, than the women, specifically women, but also men, who believe that trigger warnings are helpful. Um. I think part of it is that I don't like to condescend, and I think I don't like to talk down to people. I think trigger warnings are, in a way, condescending, saying you don't have the wherewithal to figure out what this article or this item is about. Therefore, I'm going to flag up all the, all the content. You're not smart enough. You you can't figure it out, and it feels like it's it's babying and, and talking down to. Um, it feels like it's patronising. Okay, but that doesn't actually answer my question, right? Which is to say that many women feel that uh, people, many people feel that trigger warnings are useful, and they've said as much. They think trigger warnings are useful. No government has asked you to buy trigger warnings. I disagree. Individual people have. You just simply disagree. You think that I they're just, lying. I disagree. I don't necessarily think that they're lying. I think it's it's become its own thing. The concept of trigger warnings. I think if these people tried. They would, you know, they would be able to figure out these articles aren't necessarily for them, or this media isn't necessarily for them. I just, it's, a, it's, it just feels pointless, much like the anti-harassment policies. So we're getting, we're getting to the end of our time, and I think the last, the last thing that I wanted to discuss, and I, I would like to thank you for your time. We spent over an hour so far talking about this, and I found you very engaged, and I really appreciate you coming on today to talk. Um, but the last thing I wanted to kind of discuss was the gap between where you stand today and some of the some of the um, speech that you're engaged with and where the, the ideas you want to get across and your audience or the other side's impression of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious as to what you think you might do differently uh, since your first encounter with this with this real. I mean, before the before the uh, the in defense of rape post, I think. There is a, a lower level of sort of conflict and, and engagement with this issue. Um, yeah. But since that point, what do you think that you would like to do differently or, or even do the same as you continue to participate in this conversation? Because it seems to me that you share, or at least claim to share, a large number of goals with many feminists. You, it sounds like you want to see more women at conventions. It sounds like you think that's valuable. Um, it sounds like you think that rape is a serious problem and you'd like to diminish the number of rapes. It sounds to me like you care about rape victims and you'd like to see them yeah. psychologically do well after as survivors. But many survivors uh, that, let's just say many, a number of survivors seem to take issue with the way that you approach the subject, especially in the defensive rape post. And so I'm curious as to what your thoughts are and how they've changed since, well, since you've written that post. At the same time, others, others don't. I've had others don't. Agreed. Yeah, others, there are others that don't. It's not a uniform. 
Yeah, not a uniform. Yeah, not a uniform. Um, what would I do? I think, like I said, it um, the whole experience has radicalized me a bit. I am much more forceful in my promotion of free speech and free expression. Um, I've become more of an advocate for sex workers, um, which I wasn't necessarily before. Um, I wouldn't say I've become a men's rights activist because a lot of them are as bad, in my point of view, as radical feminists. But I've definitely gotten more interested in men's issues as a result because I think we need to approach equality from both sides and ally, basically, um, to gain equality for both people. So. In terms of my own work, I think I, I, I feel that I need to believe more strongly in what I'm saying and doing um, as, as I do it. I need to be more sure of myself uh, when I write things and it, so that I, I, I feel more robust in defending it. Um, that's, that's been the main change. I wouldn't really change anything and I still stand by the, the first post because I do think difficult topics should be covered, and I don't think we should stop them being covered. Could you dig a little bit more? I, I guess I'm a little confused by this idea of, of believing it more. What do you What do you mean by that? Can you give me an example? Um, of a lot of stuff you... I've been a lot of stuff I've been criticised for was right to hire. So um, it wasn't, you know, I was told what to do and then did, did it in my own way. Um, I'm not, not about... saying. I'm not... I'm not disavowing it <laughs> or anything. I just want to say you, you, it's it. It wasn't my project. It wasn't my idea per se. Um, whereas with the newer stuff, yeah, I, I like I like to I like to be enthusiastic about our projects. I like to believe in the goals of it. I see. So it's difficult for you to defend something that you were asked to write, wrote, it, and then... I'm not. Yeah, that I'm not passionate about. Um, cool. I'd like to close today. With a question about a, an older work of yours that I think is is was surprising to me when I read mm -hmm. through a lot of your stuff in preparation for this interview. So you wrote Agents of Swing uh, mm -hmm. a while back, um, and actually, you one of the authors that you worked with on Agents of Swing is Philomena Young, who uh, she wrote a supplement for it, um, which, yeah. which you two uh, often don't see. We'll say uh, often don't see eye to eye. I've, I've got a blog on my social media now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so there's. There's, this is someone that you've worked with previously, and when I cracked open Agents of Swing to look at it, I was surprised to find that you had a really, in my opinion, amazing mechanic for dealing with women's issues in the 60s and 70s in regards to like spy games. So this is supposed to be like a James Bond, Avengers kind of yeah. 60s and 70s spy game, and you have this really cool mechanic where at the beginning of the game, uh, especially if you have female players, you're supposed to identify which issues of feminism you want to engage with in the 60s and 70s uh, so that everyone around the table is comfortable, right? So that if, if you're a female player and you want to be James Bond and you want to play in 1970 and you really don't want to deal with, you know, the threats of rape or you don't want to deal with people saying, who's this female agent? Let's get a man in here to do this right. That you can just sort of ex excise that from the game. We can say, yeah. we're just not going to do that. It's the 1960s and men and women are completely equal. And I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that mechanic, because it's exactly the kind of mechanic I would want to have in my games to protect and nurture female players, and it seems okay. to be exactly the kind of mechanic you would argue against today. Okay, we're long on time, so I'll, I'll try and skip through a few yeah. things really quickly. Um, working with Philomena Young, and also trying to work with Tracy Hurley, in the aftermath of all the previous stuff, I was trying to do an outreach and help people because they said we want to get games out there, and I think Machine Age Productions is a great model for the way that you add stuff to the conversation rather than trying to censor other people. I think they do a great oh, job. Even though I don't get on with Philomena and David anymore, I think they do a wonderful job and you should check out their games and buy them. Um, so yeah, I was trying to outreach to people with different points of view and, and get that into my work. With Agents of Swing, I was trying to find a middle path because when we're doing historical games, I am very much the opinion that we should not whitewash racism, sexism, class differences, things like that. Like if we were running a pulp game, I would include the racism and the sexism sure. and everything else in it because I think that's key to the period. And I think it does a disservice to the people that fought against that in that period if we don't include it, it if you get where I'm coming from. So yeah. I was trying to find a middle middle way for that because the spy media and so on that I'm, that I'm drawing on for Swing, uh, the female agents 
pretty much go and remark. It's just you know accepted that this is the part of the TV world, and so that was a forerunner in a way, in a lot of ways, of the sort of modern strong female characters. So that's gotten a bad rep lately. Um, but so I wanted a sort of halfway house between understanding what the historical context was and including it in the game, but at the same time not ruining yes. anyone's fun and also reflecting the fact that some of it was glossed over in the media at the time. So I thought the best way to do that was to get a mix between the, between the two, let you choose the issues you want to address and let the rest slide, because that way you get a bit of both. Absolutely. But it seems to me in there... I, I, so yes, I, so personally, as a game designer, and we haven't really been talking designer to designer, uh, today, which is which is which is unfortunate because I think there's another time. Another time. Um, that's that's exactly what I try to do, right? Is to say, look, uh, when I run a dungeon world game, there's going to be class stuff because that's what I'm interested in, right? As a, as an advocate for low income families, I think in my art, I would like to talk about class, and I think yeah. if you don't want to talk about class, that's unfortunate. Well, and we should. Game, right? Yeah, but game design exists in a weird space. You're not telling a story unless you're doing a really, really tight focus story game. Right. You're providing a context in which other people tell their own stories. So exactly. you've got to get the tools to, to do so. But it seems to me to rely on the idea that female gamers might be harmed, they might actually experience a harm by being forced to confront the sexism, the very real sexism that occurred in that world or that occurs in that media and that that might actually be bad. It might be bad. Like You the, the could make the argument... Well, yeah, I, I can see the argument. The focus to me was on whether it's fun or not, rather than well, rather than harm per se. Is it going to impact on your fun of the game? Yeah, I want the game to be an enjoyable experience. Some people enjoy exploring the, the sexism and dealing with it and fighting against it. Other people just want to shoot bad guys in the face. You know, right. both are valid, given the option. So I was concerned about the fun, not about the harm per se. But when we get to the point of talking about the fun at a convention or the fun in social media spaces, whether you think about the harm that may be done or the fun that may be limited, there are, are there different rules that apply? Is that I think there's different rules that apply there because it's a much broader conversation. I mean, at a table, especially at a con, you don't know these people. You need to establish some kind of kind of ground rules. It's different to your home game where you all know each other's limits and, sure. and everything. Conventions are a bit different, but you know, if you label your, label your, um, your sign-up sheet or whatever, not so much for a problem. I think there's a lot more we could discuss, and I'm sorry we don't have an, an infinite amount of time. Um, because well, I think this um, has been... I'm going to make myself available on uh, Twitter and Facebook and G Plus the rest of the evening if anyone wants to ask me questions or anything. And if I've got you blocked, sure. ask someone and I'll unblock <laughs> you so you can talk to me. Um, but yeah, I'll take Q&A, and I'll probably do, once this is recorded out, I'll probably append some notes to do like a... Cool. Commentary um, we, or something on my blog. Sure, we've had a number of uh, of commentators who wanted to to have the potential to issue a response, and in the spirit of free expression, Indie Plus has agreed to do that. So look for some notes in the near future uh, uh, for our audience for us having that response. We're not exactly sure who who is going to want to do that, so I don't want to name any names at the moment. But uh, there's yeah. a good chance that such a response will occur and will be conducted exactly as this was respectfully, with a lot of interrogation about the assumptions and, and underlying viewpoints that might uh, be below the sort of clash that occurs at the top level. Yeah. Um, but I do want to thank uh, James for coming on today. Um, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of talk on the internet this week about this interview, and I think um, you know, it would have been very easy for you to walk away and say this wasn't worth your time, and I appreciate you taking, the, taking a chance on me and, and on the Indie Plus staff to come here and speak. No, I'm happy to. I'm happy to talk to anybody about this stuff, really, as long as they're, they're cool about it. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Indie Plus audience. And uh, if you're interested, at 5 p.m., the Indie Plus staff will be playing Steal Away Jordan, which is a, a game about the Antebellum South, which will be every bit as interesting and controversial as this was. So please join us. Uh, and thank you all to, to those of you who watched.